Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. The 20th Judicial Circuit Court in Illinois is a trial court which hears cases from Monroe, Perry, Randolph, St. Clair, and Washington counties. Those who are dissatisfied with the trial court verdict may appeal their case to the Illinois Fifth Appellate Court, which sits in Mount Vernon. Our guest today is Steve McGlynn, a St. Clair County resident circuit judge of the 20th Circuit. His court sits in Belleville. Judge McGlynn has also served as a member of the 5th District Appellate Court. He has uh, been rated highly qualified by his peers at the State Bar Association. Judge McGlynn, welcome to Conversation. It's great to be here. Um, I want to just start briefly for those who are completely unfamiliar with the, uh, with the judiciary in Illinois and in the United States, how that is designed. You sit in a uh, what's called a circuit court. That's correct. Okay, so just describe the various levels of the circuit court and then up all the way to the, to the Illinois Supreme Court. Circuit court level is what we think of as trial court level. It's where the people go, if you have a dispute, you go before a judge or a jury, depending on how you have it set up, and it's at that level where you have a contest where the people get to listen to the facts, the finer fact gets to rule uh, on issues of fact, the, the trial judge will uh, rule on issues of law, and if you're not satisfied with that verdict, if you think that there was a mistake made, either by the finder of fact or the judge as a, on a question of law, you then get to appeal as a matter of right. You get an automatic uh, review at the appellate court level. Uh, unless it is a constitutional issue, uh, then you can appeal to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court uh, it's discretionary what the Supreme takes Court of Illinois, not the United States. The Supreme right. Court of Illinois, uh, and if there's a federal issue uh, that's raised, uh, you can appeal from the Illinois Supreme Court's decision to the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. Now, somebody gets a speeding ticket. Is that the uh, circuit court also? That goes to the circuit court. There's right. various divisions within the circuit court sure. system, isn't there? There's traffic, there's family, there's domestic, uh, there's major civil jury. I sit on major civil non-jury, so I hear all the foreclosures, I hear requests for emergency relief, uh, injunctive relief, uh, and I hear all disputes that uh, are to be resolved uh, not by a jury, but the judge sitting as a uh, finder of fact. And you're a circuit judge. What's the difference between judge. you and associate circuit? Circuit judges, um, not to get too technical on you, the biggest difference is associate circuit judges are appointed by a vote of the sitting circuit judges of that circuit and they serve a term of four years and every four years they come back for a vote by the uh, uh, circuit judges. By the judges. By the judges. Right. A circuit judge, uh, I've been appointed by the Illinois Supreme Court. The Illinois Supreme Court can appoint a judge to fill a vacancy but uh, once that term has ended the voters will decide uh, who they want as their circuit judge. If you win an election, and in Illinois our system is circuit judges run in partisan races, Republican, Democrat, uh, in November when we generally have our partisan elections, if you win that uh, as a circuit judge, then every six years thereafter you come before the voters in a retention vote. Now most people, well let's move to the federal system. So the federal, so you've got, you've got the circuit, the appellate, and the Supreme Court in Correct. Illinois. Correct. And then in the federal system you have, you have district the, the district, which and is the so, same as the circuit. Right. So the southern district of Illinois, um, roughly the southern third of Illinois, that courthouse is in East St. Louis. There's also one in Benton. If, and that's where you would go for trial, just like you would go to St. Clair County or So if you're or accused Madison of a County. federal crime if in this court, case. Right. And uh, the appeal court is the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. That sits in Chicago, but that here is appeals from several states, including Wisconsin and Indiana. Mm -hmm. And then from the Seventh Circuit, it would go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay. But the Supreme Court of the United States, like the Illinois Supreme Court, that's discretionary on their part. You don't have a right to have your case heard by the there Supreme Court. There are some cases in which you have a right to hear, or the, or the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction. Uh, lawsuits between or claims against you know one state against another 
uh, things involving uh, ambassadors or, or things like that. But most of it, uh, it is um, it's discretionary. If there was a if you're if you are uh, sentenced to death, you have uh, you ultimately can get at least one crack at the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. They'll take a look at it. They don't have to take it, but they'll take a look at whether mm -hmm. they think there's enough there to justify having a full hearing. Now, years ago, it was considered that the the judiciary was was an independent body of people who, you know, they they have their black robes. They're you know they're unattached to the political go comings and goings of the world. They were just interested in the law and interpreting the law as written. All of a sudden, it appears that there seems to be more politics involved. I will specifically state the case of uh, Car Car uh, Car Carmar versus Meg. Now, Ten just talk ago. about that. That was 2004. Ten, Ten years ago, and Justice Carmeier, uh is up for retention. Uh, well, in this describe cycle. to people what, what that was all about. Uh, in, in 2004, uh, we had here in Southern Illinois, uh, at that time, the most expensive appellate, I mean, Supreme Court race in the history of the United States. Now, in the Illinois, we elect Supreme Court judges. We elect. Okay. And not only do we, we the voters elect them, but it, we elect them the same way we elect the governor. There's a Democrat primary, there's a Republican primary, and and our judges run as Democrat, Republican, Independent, Green Party. Uh, in that case, you had Justice Mag from uh, from Madison County, who was at that time serving on the appellate court in Mount Vernon. Justice Lloyd Carmeier was a circuit judge in Washington County, and he was a Republican nominee, and many, many millions were spent on that race. It was like a $9 million race. It was as something I, I, as well, it might have been $6 million, but it was high. Yeah. And it was... For a judge, well, a Supreme Court judgeship, but there was Look, considerable ran, political ran, interest in this, right? There sure was. When I ran in 2006 in the appellate, for the appellate court, the appellate court is the same geographical di di uh, district as the district that the candidates for Supreme Court run in for Southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, mine was the most expensive appellate court race in the history of the United States. And my opponent was financed by like 10 lawyers. Most of his contributions came from 10 lawyers, and they all were plaintiff's lawyers, and they did class action cases, or they did med mal cases, or they did uh, you know, asbestos cases. So you, you had a lot of money coming in uh, into the system that I think taints the system. And I, for so, a long time, have supported moving away from uh, electing judges in partisan races so you don't have that kind of money influence. I don't have a problem with the voters having a say, for instance, the retention race. Uh, if Justice Carmeier decides he's gonna run for retention, the question on the ballot for the bo voters will be, shall Justice Lloyd Carmeier be retained as a Supreme Court judge? Doesn't say whether he's Republican or Democrat. And so people can look at his record and decide, I think he's done a good job, uh, I wanna retain him or not. But once you, we, the rule of law is very important, and people need to know when they go to the courts, they don't have to worry about politics. And unfortunately, in Illinois, um, we have a history of too much politics in our court. So depending on who gets picked to, be, to fill a spot on mm -hmm. the judiciary, they actually can shape the law as opposed to the legislature. Well, in, in the way yes that they, in, no. the, in the way that the rulings are made, for example, there has been considerable in the legislatures of many states talk about uh, whether or not you're going to limit the uh, amount of um, uh, lawsuits against doctors. It, yeah, like uh, uh, caps on damages right. or, or uh, limit the liability. So of, the legislatures apparently can't get together and make a final and decision no, and, and instruct and the judiciary. So the judiciary itself, depending on who the judges are, are kind of making the decisions uh, for the legislature, aren't they? In some states, the the courts have accepted uh, caps on damages or limitations on liability. The legislature sets a lot of of parameters with regard to litigation. The legislature will say how long you have before you bring a lawsuit. If you want to sue a municipality, you have one year to bring it. If you want to sue somebody that rear-ended you in an auto accident, you have two years to, to do it. I have cases in the, that involve real estate where you might have 20 years mm -hmm. uh, to bring a claim. So they have they they set those kind of parameters. They created 
uh, the work comp system. That's completely a creature of legislative uh, activity. And in work comp, you have caps on damages. You have limits on how much you're going to get. Uh, you know, when you're off work, it's, it's 66 and two-thirds of your average weekly wage. And they put a cap on what the average weekly wage can be. So in Illinois, we do have a lot of legislative caps on damages. When it came to the tort system, uh, injury cases, medical malpractice cases. Our Supreme Court said that in those areas, uh, the amount of damages, uh, it should be a, a purely judicial function and the legislature should butt out. I see. But now, other states, there are many other states that have, that have accepted caps on damages or limitations of one sort or another. Now the Supreme Court of Illinois mm -hmm. has considerable influence over the rules that apply to judges beneath them, is that correct? Absolutely. So they, uh, we're going to talk now about a slightly different issue, which has to do with, uh, in St. Clair County, Illinois, there right. was this whole thing which people in the St. Louis area know about, which is judges on heroin, or using heroin. Uh -huh. And um, there are those who think the time may have come where now we're going to have to drug test Judges. I'm, one, make, of, I'm one of those people. You are one of those people. I publicly call for drug testing of judges, and I have uh, personally submitted to drug testing and made the results public. Okay. But there are probably some judges that, if it's discretionary, will say, well, it's my right not to, correct? I'm the only one that You're has publicly <laughs> called for the testing of judges, and I'm the only one that I know of that has, has submitted to a drug test and provided the results to the media so mm -hmm. that they could broadcast them. Um, if the Supreme Court of Illinois said that this is part of the routine, would that be then part of the routine? It can. In other, there's um, a number of states have been looking at this, and there are some constitutional issues, separation of power issues. Some courts have ruled that that the legislature couldn't order. Uh, judges in a different, you know, a different branch of well, government. Well, I said the Supreme Court, which is the same branch as, I think, as yours. Uh, right. I think that the, the Illinois Supreme Court, by rule, uh, may be able to set up a program. Uh, I support, ultimately, the Supreme Court, by rule, setting up a program that requires, from time to time, uh, judges to submit to voluntary drug tests. And um, the the problem is with the way the Constitution is written in Illinois, the question is, is that a, can, once a person is elected, I think it's easier for appointed or non-elected officials, but once someone is elected, can, can someone other than the voters set uh, limitations on that person's term of office? And obviously, uh, if, you had a, if you had some kind of penalty page, if you, if you test in Illinois, if you, if you were tested positive for heroin, that's a felony. There is no misdemeanor possession of, of heroin. It's under state law. Mm -hmm. Federal law there is, but under state law there isn't. And so the question is, uh, what would happen? I think that all those ultimately can be worked out, that you could get to a robust system where you had uh, mandatory uh, testing of judges that um, and we had a system that was reliable, a way that if there were false positives, you could deal with it. But the, the ultimate goal is we want to get away from um, just taking people's word for it. Because when, uh, unfortunately, when the, when the tragedy uh, cost Judge Christ his life and it cost Judge uh, Cook his, his career, his, his, his career yes. everybody was saying, oh boy, we never knew, we had no idea. And so that's why I think that um, if that's the case, um, nobody could tell, nobody knew, all the more reason why to require people, to sub the, the judges to submit to drug testing. Look, drug testing has become a, an, a part of a lot of people's jobs. If you're driving a forklift, you're working in a factory, if, in some places of work, if you've got an injury, you slipped and fall, you've got to take a drug test. Well, so I think people are saying, but I don't think the judges are, are any different or so much more important than us that we have to take them, but they don't have to. But when a judge is hearing a case, mm -hmm. sometimes life or death, right. other times it's like money, you know, your money or someone right. else's money, and he's on drugs, doesn't that open <laughs> this up for review by an appellate court and maybe to um, 
throw out decisions? I mean, there could be a long list of decisions that this Judge Christ uh, had made that uh, were, are not valid. I'm going to have to be careful how I answer this because I, yes, you're, in you're one of my positions judge, as right. a sitting judge, but I also get post-judgment petitions. I handle a number of post-judgment petitions by people who have been convicted of felonies. What I would tell you is that uh, in St. Clair County, since Judge Cook got off the bench, Judge Hayda, who was the prior state's attorney and is now a circuit judge, uh, he granted a, a person a new trial who had been tried and convicted of uh, murder. Uh, and the basis for that was that Judge Cook, uh, there was evidence Judge Cook was probably impaired by drugs at the time right. he presided over that case. And that in and of itself was enough for Judge Hayda to order that we go through the whole process again. A so new trial. The new trial. So the witnesses who had to testify, they've got to come back. The jurors who spent you know, the week or however long it was, listening to this evidence and weighing, the, weighing everything, uh, their, their efforts are for naught. So when you have a, drug, a judge that's impaired by drugs, that's a, that's a serious problem. Adding to that or compounding that in St. Clair County was, it was not just an isolated incident where you had somebody who just happened to have an addiction. Look, there's a lot of people who struggle with uh, substance abuse problems and uh, you know, there's people that they, they have a back injury, uh, they're given a strong pain drug, uh, the back injury goes away, but the, drug the, the, but the addiction to the drug doesn't. So you have a lot of things like that. The problem in St. Clair County was it was more. There was evidence that, you know, Judge Chris, Judge Chris was only a judge for like 10 days. Before that, uh, he was one of the lead felony prosecutors in appearing regularly before Judge Cook. Uh, and there was the evidence mm. that they bought drugs from uh, one of the probation department uh, agents. And so you have not just an isolated incident, but you have something that looks like uh, there's a more sy uh, systemic problem within that courthouse and drugs that needs to be thoroughly examined. And is it being, uh, is it being examined and can the public at some point in the not too distant future be assured that um, that this corruption has been cleared up? I certainly hope so, and I pray so. I, I'm not in a position to prosecute cases. I can't talk about cases that ought to be prosecuted right. well, this or is what charges Mr. ought Frazier, to be. Mr. Frazier, is that? Is he the, he's the prosecutor? Brent, uh, or uh, Brendan Kelly. Kelly. Brendan Kelly. Kelly is our state's attorney. Uh, right now, the, uh, the matters with Judge Cook, uh, there are matters with Judge Cook pending in federal court. I don't know if there will be other state charges that are that that are going to be brought um, either in St. Clair or up in Pike County, where uh, the death of uh, Judge uh, Chris, who was my friend, I liked him. He was a great guy. Uh, so there could be things there. Don't want to comment on it because I don't want to be right. uh, seen as trying to prejudice people one way or the other. Right. Let's talk about something simpler in St. Louis County. Okay. There was a girl who uh, decided instead of setting up a Kool-Aid stand, she set up a cupcake stand mm -hmm. to sell cupcakes. And a city came to her and said, you can't do that. Now, I know when I was a kid, we set up our own Kool-Aid stands and we sold stuff at the curb and nobody came and made it, turned us into criminals. Uh, would you care to <laughs> comment on this, what appears to be government overreach in dictating to this girl, I forget how old she was. Like, I, I think like, I can comment on this one because it's not in my, I'm at a circuit court level. I, I, I wouldn't be hearing that case in Madison. I wouldn't be hearing on appeal. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. You know, I'm 51. When I was growing up, the Andy Griffith show was a very popular show. Busting a little girl for selling cupcakes without having the right kind of industrial uh, or commercial kitchen, that's the sort of thing Barney Fife would have done. And we would have had a big laugh. Oh, Barney, he's so, uh, he's so goofy. It, to me, what's troubling about this is it shows just how expansive government has become. And, and it is so used to regulating every aspect of our lives that it doesn't see, it doesn't see any limit anymore. And to, to say that the 
that, that government can regulate the incidental de minimis uh, contact that this young girl has selling cupcakes to some neighbors and maybe some friends, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And to say you can do it, but you have to have a commercial um, you have kitchen. To have, <laughs> ridiculous. Right. I mean, my, my daughter, who's 14, um, they have a little snow cone making machine, and the girls in the neighborhood will do snow cones. Am I going to go have to buy one of those big ones now? Or It's, it's just ridiculous. And, and, uh, well, that brings us but the, to... But I think the courts, the courts have not been vigilant enough in trying to make sure that, that government stays within its, its, its boundaries. Mm -hmm. We are, there's no question, as a society, we are over-regulated now, uh, and I think we're over-litigated, but we certainly, we are over-regulated by, by a government and bureaucracy that just is growing by leaps and bounds and sees no limits. The, the genius of our system was that the people were primary, we have certain unalienable rights, and that, that we don't exist to serve the government. The government exists to serve us. and. Um, and they don't get to tell us what our rights are, uh, but we get to tell them what their powers are and, and are not. And that has been totally distorted, I think, and I, I really do believe that judges, and as a judge, you don't wanna make the law. That you don't wanna say, well, this, I don't agree with this law, so I'm not gonna enforce it as written. There has to be a certain humility, there has to be a certain restraint. Uh, having said that, um, it is your duty as a judge when there is this gross overreach to say, hey, government, you can't do that. You can't, you can't regulate that kind of activity. Well, in New York City, the mayor there, he, he didn't like large... Didn't uh, like big, large He sodas. didn't like Big Gulp. He didn't like and the big super gulp. Big Gulp. And so then he made a rule that you could only have, I forget, it was 24 ounces right. or something like, something much smaller than a Big Gulp or a super right. Big Gulp. You could get I a believe, bottle of wine I believe uh, that, that was the, more, but you couldn't get a Big Gulp. And that's I, ridiculous. I believe that there was a judicial ruling on that, though, there wasn't was. there? And there how was did that go? A federal court determined that that, that was... Uh, an overreach. An overreach, and that it was it was unconstitutionally... Uh, broad in its scope, and it did not, uh, it did not meet a a legitimate government function, and and uh, um, uh, and so they struck it down. Now I was reading that in St. Clair County, in the public housing, which I realize is public, mm -hmm. that there has been a uh, concerted effort to uh, make even inside some of the apartments no smoking zones. Is that an overreach? I'd love to answer the question, but that is that's oh, a that's case that might come uh, before uh, uh, me I'm because sorry. if it's if there's a, in St. Clair County, if there's a challenge to uh, th that would that would be something that might come to me on a mandamus case, okay. or somebody might challenge it as unconstitutional. It would come to my courtroom, and so what you would be looking at there is weighing the government's uh, interest in saying, well, if we own the if we own the building, uh, does the cigarette smoke? Would that would that make it unsuitable for other people to live to uh, uh, to live there? Uh, does it create some kind of health hazard as opposed to people's right um, to uh, to smoke? It's a lawful it's a lawful product, and uh, and you have a right to smoke still. Here in the last five minutes, and we're down to that now. Um, today is uh, is March the twenty fifth, twenty fourteen, and the Supreme Court of the United States is hearing what's called the Hobby Lobby case. Sure. Uh, would you care to comment on that case? Uh, well, the, the describe, Green family... Describe the facts and, and what, what it is the Supreme Court is going to be hearing and perhaps uh, an opinion on that. The Green case, I mean, the Hobby Lobby, the Green family owns a chain of stores, Hobby Lobby, that have uh, a decidedly uh, faith-based bent to it. They sell uh, religious-related items, uh, they, they'll sell stuff that's tied to religious holidays. And the people who run uh, Hobby Lobby, um, their faith is very important to them. And they have, as part of the way they run their business, they try to make it consistent with their faith. Uh, Obamacare, and the Affordable Care Act, has mandated that they provide insurance to their employees. And the part of that insurance uh, would also have to underwrite contraceptives, abortifacients, which is contrary to their religious beliefs, and they don't want to have to provide that. Mm -hmm. So the question is, 
before the Supreme Court, does the government have the power to uh, impose uh, these kind of requirements on faith-based uh, entities? There was an exception carved out for churches. I didn't think it was a particularly good one. Uh, at the time that came down, I was the chairman of the board of Catholic Social Services of America, I mean of America, of Southern Illinois. And, and uh, we served a lot of non-Catholics as part of our, uh, our social services. And we employed a lot of non-Catholics. We didn't ask people when they applied, are you Catholic or not? But uh, that probably knocked us out because we weren't serving predominantly people of our own religion. But nonetheless, the issue that coming before the court is if there's sincerely held religious belief under what was known as the Sherbert test, a former uh, a previous U.S. Supreme Court case, and the Restoration of Religious Freedom case, uh, or act that was signed uh, by President Clinton, uh, passed the Congress unanimously and almost the Senate almost unanimously. It says if if someone has a sincerely held religious belief, and and there's some and the government is going to impose some substantial burden on the exercise of that, relief, that religious belief. The government has to establish two things. One, that it has a compelling state interest to do what it is doing. And two, it is choosing the means least likely uh, or least restrictive on the expression of religious freedom to accomplish that, that goal. So if the, government's, if, if the government says our uh, our important des uh, desire is to make sure that that women have access to contraceptions or abortifacients. They could give them a voucher. They don't have to require uh, the religious uh, entity for whom they work to underwrite something that might be uh, contrary to their religious beliefs. This Supreme Court has been divided on a lot of things. They have been pretty strong, though, in their defense of religious liberties. And I, I think that there will be a strong majority uh, supporting Hobby Lobby's uh, position in this case. I hear the it's decision just will come overreach. down this summer. Pardon me. The, the decision will come down this summer. You would think so. Depends on. I mean, they can they could wait years, mm -hmm. but it's likely to come out uh, sometime between June and October. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's not uh, there's not much more time to go into many many other issues. I just want to uh, say that. I'm glad that uh, that you know you've had the opportunity to come here and explain to people you know a little bit about the judiciary, a little bit about your your professional philosophy. Sorry, we stepped on, uh, almost stepped into some areas. <laughs> almost got me in trouble. That, right. That That's all right. Can't can't and don't want to don't want to <laughs> do that. Um, like to have you come back another time, talk Love more it. about this because I think people really. Uh, uh, I don't think that people fully understand what goes on in, in the judiciary. Anytime.